is there a story behind the name Lee? No, my parents liked the name and I guess never thought that I'd end up moving to Asia. Didn't even conceive of the fact that it might be confusing and a bit of an annoyance for me later on in life. It's more difficult than you might think in Asia, particularly in Hong Kong, being called Lee, because everybody sees an email from me and assumes my name is Williamson. So I get a lot of emails like, dear Williamson, or they just write like, dear William. Like they just looked at the name and were like, hmm, let's just pick this random element of one of the names and call him that. I think for anyone who's listening, they will quickly ascertain from your accent that you're English. So you grew up in England. What was your childhood like back then? My childhood was very loving. I moved around uh, a few times, which at the time felt like this huge ordeal, moving from like one part of a very small country to another part, just like 100 miles down the road. But at the time, it felt like the biggest deal because England's so small that, you know, moving 100 miles down the road feels like a, a huge thing. Born in Birmingham and then moved to Wiltshire, which is like where Stonehenge is, and then eventually to Cambridgeshire, where we moved into a converted windmill. So very kind of idyllic, this kind of fantasy idea of what an English home is in the countryside. It was very beautiful and very peaceful and tranquil. That's probably why when I graduated, I was like, let's get out of here and go to go to China for some excitement. But yeah, that perhaps instilled in me subconsciously that wanderlust and being comfortable with change, being comfortable to moving to new places, which I eventually did my whole adult life. I've never really been in one place too long. So was there a reason why you pursued politics at Durham University? Was it because you thought it would give you a chance to grow abroad? No, I mean, I think one of the things you'll find out, Ling Yao, is that most of my life is unplanned. Like, I love that John Lennon quote of life is what happens when you're making other plans, right? It's a cliche, but it's true, particularly for me. So I thought I was going to study law from like the age of 10, 11, up until the time it, it came to submit the university applications, mostly because... I was quite smart at school. My grades were pretty good, but obviously what I had in book smarts, I lacked in imagination. And so I was just like, I was just like, I want to be a lawyer. Why? I don't know. They look like they're doing pretty well on TV. And then when it came to actually thinking about it, when I was submitting my university application, I was like, oh, do I want to be a lawyer? Mm, Actually, now I better think about it. And just like a year before, I started to get into music in quite a big way. I kind of became this indie kid and started to grow my hair long and dye crazy colors. And it all came randomly. And I haven't thought about this in a long time, but I was thinking about it today when I was thinking about this interview. And I realized like a lot of it emanated from the strangest, strangest place. Like I remember getting a contract mobile phone when I was 16, which was a big deal, maybe even 15. My parents got me a mobile, which was like on a contract rather than like a pay as you go. My friends were like, whoa, dude, that's amazing. You can spend what you like on this phone. That's amazing. Anyway, and part of this package from Vodafone, the provider, was they send you a free album. And there was like a Destiny's Child album and these other things, most of which I had no interest in. And there was this one from this band, the Manic Street Preachers, who I'd kind of heard of and I knew about one of their songs. So I got that as a free album and I really liked it. And then I listened to their earlier stuff and I loved that even more. Like this album called The Holy Bible and Generation Terrorist and Everything Must Go. And they were talking about like Jean-Paul Sartre and, and Camus and Noam Chomsky and all these literary references. And I was like, whoa, this sounds amazing. And they're so angry and they're so like cool. So I started reading all this material. So I started like reading it, Chomsky and, and Camus and stuff. So I had a kind of big change in that period. And then I was like, um, I don't do law. So I guess politics and then my options are open. Because, you know, I can always do a law conversion course and I don't know, like I'm into it. So yeah, that was my like, I'm not eating at McDonald's, man, because it's too corporate phase. And then, yeah, I ended up going to university and no regrets. Durham was a great place because it's collegiate. You do get a, lot, a really full experience outside of your education as well. There was like an unofficial motto at Durham, which is like, don't let your degree get in the way of your education. And like, I definitely learned a lot there aside from politics. So you're in this bubble. How on earth do you go from this little bubble to China? So let's do a little bit of an about turn. I think it was a bit of a bumpy road. That period of time, like a last year of uni and, and leaving uni, I wasn't particularly equipped for adulthood. And for like the first time in my life, I spiraled into a depression, to be completely honest. And like I had some issues and and I couldn't quite finish my degree because I was just really burying my head in the sand and I had all this kind of anxiety and stress and so on. And so like it took me about a year to kind of get my life back on track. And then I finally did. I sought counseling and I felt good. And I was like, okay, what do I do now? Well, I guess I'll kind of push the reset button and I'll just go away for a year, teach English have some fun. You know, I have some friends that are kind of doing the whole TEFL thing, teaching English abroad. It looks like a lot of fun, a bit of arrested development, honestly. Like I don't have to go up for another year if I go away and teach English. So I was like, well, I'll just go do that. 
So I randomly decided to move to China because the Olympics are cool and China looked like this whole new frontier. Everyone's very excited about kind of rising China. To be completely honest, they didn't require a TEFL certificate. You could just <laughs> rock up and go, hey, I speak English. And so a combination of those factors led me to go to Hangzhou. I wanted to avoid Beijing and Shanghai because I wanted the real China, quote unquote. So I ended up moving to a city called Hangzhou, which is a couple of hours by train from Shanghai, where Chairman Mao learned to read English. So the mythology goes. And was it a shock to be there? Did the locals, most of them speak English or was it just a struggle or learning that you couldn't access Google and all these other things they're used to? Yeah, it was great. It was exactly what I was looking for. And I was looking to be taken completely out of my comfort zone and just have a totally different experience than a lot of my friends were having. To wake up and every day to be challenging, but challenging in a, in a really fun, exhilarating way. So yeah, I was kind of like a, a fish out of water, but it was great. I mean, to begin with, honestly, I think I was just trying to escape my problems the past difficult year I'd had in the UK. And so I was like, this is great. I can basically be like boozy student again and like teach English and Korea can wait. But then I started to grow up in Hangzhou over time. And how do you end up working at That's China in 2009? So I started writing for this local listings and culture magazine called That's China. A friend of mine who worked at the same English school got a job as the editor, and he was basically getting all of his mates to write for them. Anyone who seemed vaguely cultured or scholarly, or not even in my case, just get them to write stuff. So I started doing it. I dallied a little bit with the university newspaper and website. Always had considered myself a creative without ever actually kind of really having the guts to really apply myself to it. So this was the first time I was actually writing and it was a blast because I was not somewhere where a lot of people I knew would see what I was writing and would, would be judgmental of it. I felt definitely a certain type of freedom to do silly stuff and actually hang on a second. So randomly, I ended up doing this column called Challenge Lee or something like that, where basically every month I do like a different challenge that a reader would set and then kind of write about it kind of first person gonzo style. And the, the relaunch issue that my friend, the former teacher, launched, I dressed up as uh, Santa Claus and went busking on the streets with my friend who dressed up, was this big, like six foot four strapping rugby guy. He was dressed up as Mrs. Claus in his tiny little Santa Claus dress, tiny little red dress. And so they ended up taking a photo from that and putting it on the cover of the relaunch issue. So I know this sounds totally premeditated. You just happen to be speaking to me in my study where I have the old Mike Higgins down there. But this was the relaunch issue. <laughs> So this is me dressed as Santa Claus. I had a great time, as you can kind of gather. So this is kind of a young me, close up. One of my friends who was doing the design for it, his inspiration was one of those National Geographic covers with a close-up of a gorilla's face. And I was like, oh, thanks. That's charming. So as you can probably tell, it was just a whole lot of fun. And so I just didn't feel restricted by anything. I was just writing and enjoying it and kind of cutting my teeth in a way that I didn't really feel like there were any consequences to doing it bad. I was practicing. So I was digging further into that China. Isn't it state-owned and it's pretty much written for expats in the country? It's a very complicated story about licensees. And yeah, it was owned by a local Hangzhou entrepreneur who had a media business and did a lot of custom publications. And this magazine was basically, I think, his lost leader. He did it for the prestige of running an English language magazine. It was a title that was created about 10 years before, then defunct, and this guy bought the license to publish under it. So it was just like one Chinese boss smoking Lichon cigarettes and drinking green tea and not really interfering too much with these strange people and their ideas of what should be in the magazine. I read some of the articles that you can still find by Mark Kito, who started That's Beijing, That's Shanghai, That's Guangzhou. And he was basically saying that he had a really, really difficult time because he was a foreigner and he was never treated as a local. Was this a story that was very prominent at the time? Were you aware of that tension? I met Mark Kitto in Beijing later on when I was at Time Out and he was doing his kind of leaving tour as he was about to leave China after he released that article, which was a fairly kind of bitter farewell yeah. to China. Basically. And he went viral, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Every expat in China was talking about it for that month. And yeah, and he basically yeah, wrote this article saying you'll never be Chinese. And it was talking about how his experience of trying to do business in China, trying to do a joint venture, and ultimately, long story short, getting screwed over and then getting kicked out of the company that he formed. And at the time, I caught a lot of people's attention because uh, I think it was more of a David Goliath story. You know, this happens all the time when big multinationals like Danone come in and do a joint venture with a Chinese company and and they kind of lose their like the intellectual property and lose court battles and so on. But they're not so 
interesting stories because they're big corporations. But this guy happened to him and it happened to him in the very early days. And he did a very good job because he works in media of kind of getting the story out there about uh, what happened to him. And then many years later, when he decided to leave, he wrote this article, You'll Never Be Chinese, which basically, as the name implies, wasn't a particularly fun farewell. That's not the experience I had at all. Uh, clearly, uh, it got screwed over in business, and I don't deny that happens an awful lot. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're a multinational corporation or a kind of SME owner. For me, on just the anecdotal, small-scale level, I never felt any prejudice or racism quite the opposite in fact i think i was a lot more welcomed and tolerated than it would have been the other way around than someone chinese for example coming to the uk and uh, having as bad at english as i have had chinese and not integrating as much as i didn't integrate yeah so nothing that i found at all with the power of retrospection, why do you think that's the reason? Is it because do you think you didn't start your own business and was trying to get a huge chunk of the profits, perhaps? Apparently, there was this exodus of expatriates from China, especially in the literary and journalistic scene at the time. And they also wrote essays about leaving too. Yeah. So for me, I mean, definitely, I don't know if these are exactly the same time, but like a, a couple of years after this, Xi Jinping's China did start to manifest itself. After he came into power in 2012, Definitely the, the gradual opening up of the country that was happening under Hu Jintao for the previous decade did begin to kind of reverse itself. And obviously, we've very much seen the consequences of that over the past five or so years in terms of the way China's relationship with the world has changed, the way China has changed. And so, yeah, definitely a couple of years later, there was more of a kind of crackdown on, on certain things. And uh, journalist fees is not being renewed, some of whom are my friends. But yeah, I, I don't know if this was necessarily the same time or related to what Mark went through. I think it was more just like in China from like 2012 to now, basically. You know, if you just look at the two Olympics, the 2008 Olympics that announced China's arrival on the world stage, re-emergence and then the world stage, and everybody's been so massively impressed. And the narrative being mostly positive. And you compare that to the narrative ahead of this upcoming Olympics, like the Winter Olympics in Beijing, it's kind of like night and day. You know, now you have diplomatic boycotts of the Olympics and China kind of digging its heels in the mud and being much less like, oh, please please love me, look, here I am, judge me, just being like, no, this is who we are, being much more assertive in its way. So those two kind of totem poles, I think, are emblematic of the way China changed and ultimately why I decided to leave as well. Did you feel like there was an increased censorship in terms of what you could freely write without being concerned about your own safety? I was writing about where to get a good burger and like the best way to see the hidden stuff in the Forbidden City. I think we've missed part of the story, but I went to uh, eventually work at Time Out Beijing and then, and then yeah. run it as editor for a few years. So no, I mean, I didn't feel for my safety in any shape or form. We didn't have to submit to censors, but there was a certain amount of self-censoring. So previous editors to me, they did used to have to go through the government censors before they would publish. But what they would do, they told me, was... Every issue, every month, the censors would take one article out, right? Because they're doing their job. So they need to prove to their boss that they are on the case. They're being vigilant. So they would take something out, even if it was the most vanilla edition ever. So what the editors, my predecessors did, is they would write something that they would know had gone too far, but they wrote it to get taken out. So they wrote it not really caring that much about the piece, but just kind of doing it because they knew it. It would be the one thing they'd take out, and so they'd be very strategic. So they wouldn't get anything that they worked on that they loved taking out. They'd just get this one piece that they kind of banged out. I mean, certainly there's a certain amount of self-censorship. Anyone who publishes in, in mainland China has a certain amount of self-censorship around the particular kind of hot-button issues. But for the most part, my job was loving Beijing and prophesizing about how great Beijing was to live in as a city, which was a really easy thing to do because I love Beijing. It was a fantastic place, especially in those early years. It did feel like the new frontier, like the streets of paper gold. This is the land of opportunity. This is like the new world, the new world order. But certainly this is like where the new narratives are. And uh, yeah, it was thrilling. So my job was to go and stand on a milk crate every day and, and say like to a global English language audience, this place is great and you should come here and visit or live. And if you do, make sure you go see this tourist attraction or this show or make sure you eat here. And that was a lot of fun. Wasn't that a time where the media landscape was shifting a lot and you really had to adapt to the times? Again, not particularly writing about where to get good Beijing duck. <laughs> <laughs> you had to relaunch timeoutbeijing.com as well, right? Yeah, we did. 
So that was mostly just to improve the, the website, to improve the UX, because it was a bit of a clunky old site. But yeah, that wasn't necessarily anything to do with censorship or what we could or couldn't write about. It was more just about improving the product. And I think that experience was very much led to my interest in product development in media and kind of seeing media as product. Because it was my first real like rolling up my sleeves experience of how do you improve a product so it can better serve the needs of your audience. I originally got into media for the glamour and the glory, obviously. And then the kind of fun of having a byline and, and being, being, being in a creative industry. And this was the first time I did something, which I've subsequently done a lot in my career and that, that I really enjoy, which is building products that serve audience needs and kind of building communities around that. So that's what relaunching timeoutpaging.com was all about. Can you take us into your mindset at that time as an editor? How were you thinking about the various products that Time Out was offering and how you positioning to the people? As you said in your bio that you had three profitable years. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I think if you want a, a successful career in media, you can't live in a bubble. And it's increasingly difficult, particularly if you're in lifestyle media. If you're not in hard news, it's increasingly difficult to have that kind of church state divide between like editorial and everything that involves money. As like the senior editorial person there, it was my role. I saw it as my role to work very closely with the commercial department to build products that could be monetizable. So in my time there, we launched a family magazine because there was a lot of revenue streams coming there from international schools. We launched a map, which we did in partnership with the Beijing airport, um, the international capital airport there, and any number of different... We had to pivot quite quickly to WeChat, like everybody did. So we had to be agile because all the advertisers wanted to be on WeChat and that's where the audience was. So that was one of my first lessons as, as well of like, you need to go where your audience is. You need to sometimes make some tough decisions. And sometimes that means cutting down on stuff that you may personally love, but you realize there's less of a market demand for it. So in my case, like most media junkies, I love print, but like there was less of an appetite for it from our readership and less of an interest in it from our advertiser base. And so like over time, the print product was getting thinner and thinner, but our digital output was increasing and we were on more and more channels and we're focusing on WeChat and so on. And I think that agility, especially working in media where margins are getting squeezed and there's definitely more prosperous industries to be in. I'm very bullish on media in general, by the way, maybe we'll get into that later, but it was an important lesson to make, like making difficult decisions in that regard. But as an editor, ultimately your job is to just make fun, cool editorial that people want to read and they want to talk about, that they want to share. Like the stories that I remember are some of the more kind of heavyweight stories. Like we did the first interview with Ai Weiwei to be published in mainland China since he was detained back in 2010. We did uh, the first ever sex issue. We did this massive sex survey uh, and got in a little bit of trouble for it, but it was fun <laughs> kind of push the boundaries. We did a big cover. It was just this huge red cover that across it just said sex. <laughs> just said like, you're having it. Here are all your dirty secrets. And um, we did get some international schools, which we were distributed to writing us angry letters and, and sending us back the issues. It's kind of fun editorial wins like that. I remember we did this article in our food section called the 7-Eleven Challenge. And we got like two of the best chefs in Beijing and gave them like a hundred RMB, like 15 US dollars. I said, go buy stuff in 7-Eleven and make a gourmet meal out of it. So we gave them a challenge to kind of use these ingredients, only stuff they get in 7-Eleven and try and make a gastronomic feat out of it. So kind of fun stuff like that. These are the things you remember as an editor. I wanted to talk more about that Iwa Ray edition because that sounds really, really fascinating. I mean, what's the backstory behind that? How did you get him to agree to do it? I wish I had a more interesting story to, to tell you, Lingya. It was more just that Time Out International wanted to do it because he had a, a big show coming up, I think at the Serpentine or the Tate or something. And so they helped to arrange it. So I went to up to his compound on a, on a Saturday morning in Tao Changi and we interviewed him and he was delightful actually. He took a few minutes to warm up but when he did he was very gracious and, and generous with his time and yeah fun and funny and, and honest and uh, this is the time when he was really big on Instagram was posting all the time so he posted a couple of photos of me during the interview and I kind of walked out and was like ah I'm on Iwayway's Instagram and then I kind of like made some dumb joke on one of the images he put up and he was like ha ha and I was like oh my god look at me the, the Iwayway Instagram buddies so yeah so that was interesting so it was the, the first interview with him since published in mainland china since he'd been detained in 2010 that was a landmark deal but again speaking of the kinds of hoops that you sometimes have to jump in in china like we couldn't put it on the cover just in case the wrong official saw it in like the airport or something going to starbucks and was like ah 
So we ran it, but we just didn't make a, a song and dance of it. He did his first ever headline show in the mainland China gallery in 2015, which is crazy because he was massive by then internationally, but he'd never actually done a big show in mainland China. And we worked with him and he designed our cover, which was awesome. This is going to seem like I'm the most egotistical person in the world because I have like that cover before, but I actually, I'm actually looking at it now. So just for the safe sense of illustrations, <laughs> I'm in my study, I, I will show it to you. I got a signed copy. So he designed our cover and obviously it said I like in his character, but we couldn't say it was designed by Ai Weiwei. So at the corner, we had to put I, I, what's this then? Guess who's designed our cover? What it means <laughs> that speaks to those kind of like opaque laws that you have to kind of get around. So how do you go from time out to working at Tetlo? What really appealed to me about the Generation T project, the Gen T project, was this really exciting new brand, new project. It had really worthy aspirations, which is trying to build community and connecting and inspiring young leaders in Asia who are shaping the future of the region for the better. So it was really cool to begin with. And this opportunity to work regionally, but then also it was a brand new project. So I was like the first hire to use startup parlance. So we cover startups a lot at Genty. We also kind of use a lot of startup nomenclature and kind of operate like a startup in that we're a kind of separate business unit and we're pretty agile and so on. So I was the first hire brought on board to help the head of Gen T build this project. And that was really exciting because it was a blank sheet of paper. It was like working for a startup, but it was a startup within a legacy media company, which meant that we had the resources of a legacy media company. So we had stuff like distribution and finance and IT and HR and an amazing creative team and photography team, all these benefits. And when we call, we'd say like, hi, I'm calling from Gen T in the early days. And they're like, uh, sorry, what? And you say, I'm calling from Tatler. And they go, oh yeah, Tatler, cool, cool, cool. So that was like an instant, like kind of few steps up the ladder. So we were kind of starting from scratch, but we were sitting on the shoulder of this giant in the region, which is Tatler in the region, which, which opens a lot of doors, which gave us a lot of benefits. So ultimately the opportunity to really build something and feel ownership of something from scratch and to do that regionally across eight markets across Asia was really, really enticing to me. And so that combined with my desire to move to Hong Kong, a different kind of lifestyle as I just become a, a new dad, factored in with me moving to Hong Kong to help launch Gen T across Asia. As you've mentioned, Tetler is incredibly established. So what was the reason that they were deciding to launch Gen T? Was it because they felt that there was a pivot in terms of the interest and the kind of people they wanted to reach? And what kind of additional thing element did Gen T bring? Yeah, I think in a lot of ways, Gen T has been a guinea pig for a lot of the evolution that's happened at Tatler over the last couple of years. Since early 2020, when Tatler relaunched and rebranded, it's gone from being a society magazine that covered luxury lifestyle and quote unquote high society to, you know, evolving into a much more progressive idea of what influence and what power and what society is. So going from covering like a few families to covering the best of power, influence, and style across Asia, regardless of what the lineage of that is. And Gen T, a few years before this relaunch, was very much a kind of test balloon in that regards, in that it was a platform for people who were successful, who were shaping the future of Asia, regardless of where they came from. And we were launching new media products like uh, newsletters, social media, podcasts for this audience. We were launching a new type of media uh, and a very different kind of tone of voice, a very different brand identity. And I think a lot of the success of that led to Tatler eventually seeing the market to evolve. How are you guys defining, say, what success means and what influence and power means? And I think Tatler, like the idea of what society is in general has evolved. And, and Tatler needed to, to evolve with the times to recognize people who are, who are shaping the future of Asia through their work, through their mission rather than because of who their parents were. And that is a change that we're seeing, I think, more and more in the region, particularly in Hong Kong. And Tatler evolved to reflect that, which is really exciting, which was also represented by the fact that we launched the inaugural Asia's Most Influential list in December of this year to honour and to recognise these people. So that's, again, another natural evolution of the Gen T list, which identifies the leaders of tomorrow, people showing huge amount of potential. People have already reached a lot of success already, but have much further to go to be the establishment and AMI, which really celebrates the pinnacle of achievement in business, in philanthropy, in social impact. 
I mean, I feel like there are a lot of lists out there. You have the Forbes 30 under 30, you have the 40 under 40. How were you thinking about creating your own list? Because a lot of the people, when I talk to them, they will always ask me the question of, oh, what's the point of another list? Isn't it just glorifying yourself? Yeah, I can't comment on a competition. You said it, not me. But one of the differences between GMT and some other lists that you can see is that for some other lists, it's a numbers game. It's get a bunch of people on the list, get their name spot right, get a picture, put it in the magazine, click, click, come for a shoot, goodbye. With Gen T, getting on the list is not the end of the journey. It's the beginning of your journey. So we say that Gen T was like the mafia. Like once you're in, like you never get out. So when you come in, when you come onto the Gen T list, that's how we build that community. So getting on the Gen T list, of course, it's an accolade and it's something you can put on your LinkedIn or your Wikipedia page. And, and we get that all the time, of course. But it's the benefits that you get from being part of the Gen T community. So it's being covered in our content. It's being connected to like-minded young leaders, both in your country and across Asia as well. It's the kind of ancillary benefits that come from being part of our community, like access to various events or information as well as, yeah, connections you wouldn't otherwise be able to get. I think that's the Gen T difference. We've had so many collaborations between businesses on the Gen T list, people that have met through us. We, we've lost count. We stopped tracking. We've got uh, about uh, half a dozen companies that have come out of the Gen T list of honorees that have gone on the list for, for something else and then met each other and then started another company together. So many investors, investees have met through the Gen T list. We even have a marriage that has come out of our community. So two entrepreneurs that met in Shanghai, they're both on, on the Gen T list from China, met through our event and are now married. So, you know, community is at the focus of everything we do. And I think that's the key difference in that we're creating a list to build a community because what we want to do is identify these people. But then once we've done that, we want to help to catalyze their impact. And, and that's where the rewarding part is for me. It's not just like, hey, you're on a list, snap, snap, thanks, bye. It's, it's building relationships, building community with these people and helping them do the amazing things that they do, doing what we can as a media platform to kind of amplify their message, to connect them with others and to support them how we can. Are there particular examples that you're proud of to show that you have really helped to build this community? So many. I think one of the things that's been really gratifying is seeing how through the connections that we've built, people have kind of taken it upon themselves to keep the conversation going. So they will connect with other Gen T honorees uh, across the region. Back when you could travel, you know, I remember meeting a Gen T honoree in KL. And it's like, whenever I travel for business, I'll look at the Gen T list in like Taiwan, say, if I'm going to Taiwan, and I'll find people and I'll message them on Instagram and I'll say, hey, I see your Gen T too. Do you want to join me for a drink? Because it's like, for him, that is like, the fact that they're on Gen T is, so we've already done the research for them, that there's someone worth knowing. And they'll at a certain level um, where a conversation would be interesting for him. So I think just things like that, we really created a community of like-minded people that kind of speaks to how we've been able to build community. And our community have, have come with us on, on highs and lows. Began initially, so Genti was a, uh, incubated under Tatla locally for a couple of years. So like Singapore Tatla had a Genti, Taiwan Tatla had a Genti. And then we took these eight individual kind of sub-brands, like they operated in silo and locally and turned it into one pan-Asia brand. And we did this in early 2019. The goal being to kind of come out with a big uh, launch event, which was the Gen T Asia Summit, which was a big ideas festival to kind of uh, celebrate bold and, and, and put in ideas and, and leaders that have them in Asia. And then the protests hit in Hong Kong. And so our November day got postponed to April 2020 and the rest. So we had to pivot to virtual events. We've done, I don't know, I think 60 or 70 virtual events since the beginning of the pandemic now, too many to recall, but also to small scale community events, which at the time we were like, oh, this is really span out our plans. Like, how do we really make an impact with these small events? We want to bring like two, 300, 400 people into like a big swanky ballroom and have these amazing like talks and experiences and, and bring people together so they can really connect. Now, how can we fulfill our mission otherwise? But in a way, sometimes when you get lemons, kind of make lemonade, we discovered quite quickly that these small scale events were actually having potentially more impact than the big events. Because big events are something you can quite easily consume passively. You can go to an event, you can watch a talk, you can meet a couple of people, but then you go back to your hotel room and that's kind of it. You're still kind of feeling it alone. If you have like a lunch in a pretty private location with like eight entrepreneurs from different industries in the same market and maybe like a, a high level speaker for example which is a, a format we do quite a bit then 
sparks fly people feel like they can be honest they can share they're not just passively consuming the content they're engaging in the content they're contributing they're asking each other questions they're learning from each other we find that the impact of that is a lot higher because they'll go off and tell 10 people how great that event was rather than if you watch like just a, a panel discussion like oh yeah that was pretty good we run a number of lunches with kind of guest speakers in hong kong for example and so many times a lot of the honorees will come up and say that's the best lunch i've had all year like, when can I come to another one? This has been like sparks have flown. And so I think that's an example of like in these small ways, how we try and add value to our community. Because ultimately, that's the acid test, right? When you pull together a list of high people based on high achievement, and then you try and build community around them, obviously, these high achievers are exceptionally busy. That's how they got to that level of success. So anything that you do, if you want their attention, if you want their eyeballs on an article, or if you want their time to come to your event, you need to add value to their life. And I think by virtue of just how many successful uh, entrepreneurs and, and leaders of all fields, whether we have all such talks on the JNT list, whether it's like Malaysia's youngest parliamentarian or like the founders of like unicorn companies, they make time to come to JNT events. And I think that is something that really speaks to the impact we've been able to make. For those who are looking to organize an event for high achieving people, what are the main things for them to consider? Since clearly Tell has done it really, really well. I think you start with why, <laughs> such as what your podcast is about. I think like when you're building any media product, start with empathy, start with empathy and put yourself in your audience's shoes and be like, okay, the people we want to reach, what do they need? What do they have right now? What do they not have right now? What can they gain from our offering? And you have to really honestly ask that question because it's very easy to be like, yeah, we're great. So of course everyone would come, but like really, really honestly, like ask yourself that question and try and figure it out. So whoever your audience is, if they need X, go and make sure that you can deliver X for a really, really high quality. So in the case of like entrepreneurs and other young leaders who are very busy and very careful about how they spend their time, you just got to make sure that anything you do is adding value. So maybe it's giving them a connection that they wouldn't otherwise have a connection with. Maybe like it'd be a big tycoon and maybe someone else in their industry and in another market they might not know. Or maybe it's uh, access to content or information that is exclusive to them. And whatever it may be, you need to make sure that you're answering an audience need. And it's the same no matter what demographic of people you're trying to appeal to. To understand their needs means that it's probably not going to be found on the internet. So that means you need to gain trust for them and others for them to share. How do you gain trust and build that trust with all these different high achieving people? Exactly. Like the, the old, uh, you know, design thinking classic stages, it begins with empathy. It starts with listening and not like going in with your preconceived notions, but actually like asking open questions and listening. And I find that to be the most exciting time. So it's actually something I'm doing for another project we're working on at Tatla right now. We're starting with the empathy stage and we're doing some interviews. We're about to start doing some interviews. We'll just finish the questionnaire with some of the honorees on our AMI list, for example. And so I'm going to go to some of the biggest tycoons in Asia and be like, so what do you need <laughs> that you don't already have? And the answer is going to be, well, probably very little. But like, that's the challenge is in trying to find out, because when you have pretty much everything the money can buy, like what can you give them? So you better come up with something unique. And so that's really, really exciting. So yeah, it's always starting with trying to figure out your audience and, and what motivates them and, and how you can turn a pain point in their life into like a positive. 